Listener Production. G'day, it's Rusty here, all set for part two of my podcast with IndyCar commentator and accomplished Aussie sportscaster Lee Diffie. If you haven't heard part one yet, make sure you head back to the library and hit the gas on it. Diff talks about his early years around motorcycles and a lifelong friendship with 500cc race winner Daryl Beatty. Uh, how he made ends meet after leaving a teaching job to chase the broadcasting dream and not being afraid to take a risk to create opportunities in the Northern Hemisphere. He's a great believer that life's a journey and to enjoy it along the way. Now, normally I'd apologise for being a little self-indulgent with some of our stories from our time working in the supercars pit lane and beyond, but they were seriously among the best days of our lives and it's nice to share a little bit of that with you. We take the mickey out of each other and relive some embarrassing moments. I once wrestled the wheel, the steering wheel, off an Aussie racing car, for example, and tried to drive no-handed. Bit of YouTube gold for you to search there. He crashed in a celebrity supercross event, breaking his leg on the eve of a big supercars broadcast. We begin part two by talking, though, about the king of stitch-ups, Steve Parrish, Barry Sheen's great mate, who, incidentally, you can find in the Rusty's Garage Library. I don't think I've ever laughed so hard. There is no point having a sense of humour failure when you're around Stavros, but you have to be on your guard. Well, that, that, yeah, um, I was doing. I was actually working for. So while I was working for the BBC, I was also doing some stuff for for RPM on Network Ten, and I was doing. Uh, I was doing the London to Sydney Marathon. And this was in uh, 2000, 2001. I think it was in, yeah, whatever year it was. And uh, and I'd, I'd finished at Hockenheim. I'd finished a round of the World Superbikes at Hockenheim. And then the, the 10 crew, they'd, they'd done the London, like the, the rally had started. They'd come over to Europe and the, the camera crew and car, they picked me up outside Hockenheim Racetrack. So I gave Steve my three BBC shirts, you know, one for Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I said, mate, I'm so sorry, but could you get your wife Ruth to, to wash these? And could you bring them back? Because when I finish, when I finish these 10 or 11 days on the road of going all through Europe and Eastern Europe, then I would come back to Mazzano uh, for the next round of the World Superbikes two weeks later. So I came back and they were beautifully folded and they were in a nice pile. They were waiting on my bed. And when I got to the room late at night and I was so tired from, you know, like every day we we're working flat out, you know, going through Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Turkey, Greece. Like it was, we were all over the shop. Uh, an amazing experience. So I just, I got up the next morning, had a shower, had a shave. I saw my shirt there and I literally just picked the top one up. I unbuttoned it and I just put it on. I didn't, I didn't think anything. I didn't look at the back of it or the side of it or anything. I just put it on. And in those iron-on letters, they were about that big. I looked like a football player across the back. He'd had, he'd had his wife iron-on stiffy across the back of it. So I'm, so I'm walking, I'm walking through the Mazzano World Superbike paddock and I'm waving at the Ducati mechanics. Hey mate, how are you? And they're kind of looking at me strange and I'm waving. And people kept looking at me and I'm thinking, what the bloody hell are they looking at? Anyway, it just so happened it was coincidental that at that same meet was part of uh, an RPM uh, Network 10 Motorsport overseas trip. So Billy Woods and, and Daryl Beattie were there as well. Anyway, they were they were crying with laughter. They said, "Oh, you poor bugger! We got to tell you, you got you got stitched up big time. Take your shirt off and have a look what's on the back." And anyway, that was an easy one from Stavros. There were there were a lot more difficult ones with him, where he would uh, you know just. Yeah, outside of Monza one year, we, you know, you got the you got two massive roads going in either direction, and there was a traffic jam. Steve's like, "I'm not sitting in this," so we drove up the middle, up the middle island, or it bounced off there, and we drove up the sidewalk, up the footpath. <laughs> we did. Um, we went to a Yamaha dinner once in in uh, I think that was in Italy as well, and it was down by this little canal, and there was no parking on the street, so Steve just drove down the pedestrian stairs and parked right out the front of the restaurant. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, he, the, the skies were the limit with Stavros. He was crazy. He is crazy. Then he had his remote control fart machines. We'd be sitting in the lounge for British Airways and, uh, and he had, it's like a, like a garage clicker, right? And he's got this thing that, that looked 
you know, kind of about the size of about the size of your iPhone, and uh, he'd go and put it behind the newspaper stands, and you know, you know, those lounges are all a little bit stuffy, and everyone's very quiet. And Steve would be like, "Yeah, Steffy, Steffy, have a look. This guy walking up here, he's going to go and get the Times. We'll, we'll trick him." So, guy, as he's reaching for the newspaper, Steve would press the button, and he'd be like. <laughs> And the guy look around. And everybody's looking at him, and you can see on the guy's face, it's like it wasn't me. I didn't do anything, you know. And so, uh, yeah, every every time with with Steve Parrish, there was something going on. I don't know that it was his fault. It may have been someone else, but there was some hijinks too, mate. Around, I think you treated yourself to an Audi while you were living in England, and you might have gone to Brands or to Donington. I can't remember where, and you'd parked it somewhere. And didn't someone fully sticker up the passenger side of the car and you didn't realise till you got home? <laughs> yeah, and that was thanks to Steve. Steve had convinced him that that would be a good idea was and it? I had to peel all the stickers off. There must have been 300, 300 of these little stickers. <laughs> on. I, was, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't too happy. I wasn't good to be around on that day. Classic, mate. Um, the World Superbike chapter is remarkable. I mean, you, you look at uh, Colin Edwards, Carl Fogarty, Troy Corsa, Troy Bayless, I mean, amazing to be a part of that for a good couple of years wasn't it yeah it was it was fantastic i mean that was probably the the big um the big eye opener for me and 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 growing up and learning about global motorsport you know firsthand as opposed to being a viewer and, and enjoying it or, or calling it remotely off the tube or whatever it might have been actually you know traveling to kyle army and uh, going to japan and to sugo and being at Assen and Monza and Hockenheim and all of these legendary circuits that I'd only ever seen on TV. You know, and Steve and I, um, we, we got into a really good routine where as many as we could, we'd try and run the circuits to learn the circuit. I mean, he knew them. He knew them from his bike racing days and his truck racing days. But, you know, to help me learn them, we, we would, when we could, and when the weather was good, we'd jog them. And wow. uh, that was great. I mean, really, really happy, really happy memories. Um, uh, getting to know the team and you know and there was a good contingent a small contingent but a good contingent of Aussies mm. as well like whether they be mechanics or engineers but then you know you had the two Troys Troy Bayless Troy Corsa Andrew Pitt Carl Muggeridge um I'm trying I'm uh Chris Vermeulen was was a young fella there he was in world super sport on the Castrol Honda and I hope I'm not forgetting anybody, but yeah, it was, it was really good. So, um, and the life in the paddock at the end of the day, you know, cause the guys had all their motorhomes there and, and, um, you'd kick back and have a beer in the hospitality suites and, and where it'd be with, 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 uh, Troy Corsa when he was riding for Aprilia or Troy Bayless when he was riding for Honda or, uh, sorry, Troy Bayless when he was riding for Ducati. We, we would spend time in, in the Castrol Honda hospitality. So yeah, it was, it was good. It was, it was a big learning experience for me as to what it was like to work and travel on a, on a world championship. Did you ever fly Plummet Airways, which is what Steve, oh, did yeah. you t- tell people about yeah. that? <laughs> so Plummet, Plummet Airways, uh, is Steve Parrish's made up name for his plane and for what he does. And, you know, Steve's flown many a, a celebrity. Actually, when our mate Daryl Beattie crashed in the 1995 uh, um, uh, Motorcycle World Championship when him and Mick Doohan were, were battling it out for the world title and Daryl crashed in Assen, it was Steve who brought Daryl back to the UK for his surgery wow. uh, on Plummet Airways, yeah. which I, I, wish I, I wish I'd paid better attention. And I think Steve's changed planes now, but it's like a Cessna. It's like a four-seater Cessna or something like that. And uh, he, has, he has stickers and signs made up. Uh, where he lives now, <laughs> where he lives now, he, he lives, he lives in a house that's on a farm and, uh, the farm, you know, he, he has bought this place from, from the farmer, but behind, behind where all the agricultural sheds and everything are is an airstrip, a grass airstrip. So he has his plane right out the back of his house. And as you go out the gate, and it, it's the only gate, by the way, it says gate one plummet airways and there's his plane sitting there. <laughs> and so, uh, we, we, uh, we flew, we flew to the Assen round of world superbikes one year. So we flew into a place called Groningen and, uh, from the UK and. Yeah, it was fun. His wife at the time made up little lunch boxes, you know, and it had like a little gin and tonic and it had some cucumber sandwiches and in flight <laughs> meal, like meal. lunch boxes in it. <laughs> and it had thank you for flying Plummet Airways on it. He is mad. We love catching up with him. In the midst of, I'm not sure what year it was, maybe it was 01, mate, or at some point, clearly um, the idea of going to the US where you are now, your, your second and, and longest stint of the US, we'll get to that, but Clearly, the, the first window of, you know, maybe I might go and have a crack at the United States. How did that come about? It came about because I didn't get the Formula One job. So whether it was, whether it was um, 
uh, you know, whether ignorance was bliss or I was so naive or uh, I was just so determined, I don't know what it was, um, probably a little a, a blend of all of them. I, I went to the UK because uh, I didn't go to the UK because I wanted to call World Superbikes. That was a bonus, right? But I went to the UK because I had to work out a stepping stone because I knew Murray Walker was going to retire. And I thought, well, may as well aim for the top. I want to I want to try and get Murray Walker's job. And uh, they were already in the phases then in 2000, 2001, um, when it became public that they were starting to give other people kind of rehearsal goes. So James Allen would do several, Ben Edwards would do one or two, and uh, they would see, you know, they would see how other people fitted, you know, talk about massive shoes to fill, um, you know, following a legend. Yeah. And uh, so... As it turned out, you know, connections and contacts are everything. My producer at the BBC, Mark Wilkin, um, was a long-time producer of Formula One at the BBC. So the legendary story about, uh, I want to say it was in Monaco, I think, you know, when Murray Walker and James Hunt, uh, for many years, they had to share the one microphone, one of those lip ribbon microphones. You know, Murray would talk for a bit, wow. James would yep. talk for a bit, Murray would talk for a bit. Well, both had the, both had the same thought about each other that the other spoke for too long. So James would snatch the microphone off Murray and Murray would snatch the <laughs> microphone off James. And um, this one time James had had enough and and he was getting ready to biff Murray. Whoa. And it was Mark Wilkin, it was Mark Wilkin who stepped in and said, no, knock that off. That's not going to happen. Everybody calm down. So Mark, you know, knew the Formula One world in and out and he knew the then head of ITV Sport, a guy called Brian Barwick, and he wrote me this uh, really wonderful um, letter of recommendation, and I got an interview, and so I got down to the final three, and or part of the final three, and the final three were um, Ben Edwards, myself, and James Allen. And James was at the time a pit reporter for ITV, so you know he was already part of the team, and understandably and and rightly so, they picked him. Um, it was super intimidating. Uh, when I went to the meeting, you know, uh, Brian sat back, put his feet up on the desk, and and folded his arms and tell me, said, uh, tell me why I should replace Murray Walker with you. Wow. I was like, I was like, oh, shit. Mm. <laughs> okay. Mm. Uh, think fast, think fast, think fast. And uh, anyway, so I didn't, I didn't get that job. And um, at the time, um, <laughs> you know, we were young guys, right? Mm. Everybody loves free, everybody loves free, cool stuff. And I used to get free, no fear gear mm -hmm. and uh, the clothing and, um, my friends who ran the, the UK and European side of No Fear, they were American Norwegian and a buddy of theirs was coming over from uh, the US. He was going to be in London and uh, he was the, at the time, he, he was in charge of a lot of the creative stuff and marketing for No Fear, but he was also tapped into Cart, Champ Car at the time. And I had told my friends, Tom and Inga, that I didn't, I missed out on the Formula One job, and they were like, "Well, you should, you know, you should go to IndyCar. You should do kart." And we know just the guy who might be able to help you with that. His name's Jim Hancock, and he's going to be in London. Why don't you get together and have a beer with him? Wow. And I and I uh, I literally uh, went and saw Jim uh, one day. Had a meeting uh, with him at his hotel, and he's like, "Give me one second. He calls. Uh, he called Chris Pook, who was the head of car, Champ Car at the time. And he's like, I'm sitting here with this young Aussie guy uh, who I've met through friends. Uh, Formula One want him. <laughs> and and what, what, why should Formula One have him when IndyCar should have him, you know, or Kart should have him? And, and, uh, and he's like, blah, 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 blah. And he hung up and he goes, let's go and get a beer. And from the time we were walking from his hotel, we're walking along the side of Hyde Park, we we're going to a pub nearby. In that short walk, my phone rang uh, from um, a, a gentleman called Don Helms from Kart International television and he said, we'd like to offer you a job. Can you be in the United States in February or March or whenever it was? Amazing. And, I, and, I, and that's how it all, that's how um, that came about. Amazing, mate. Mm. I'm really glad that you mentioned about the Formula One um, side of things because in the midst of getting to the top three and the heaviness around the, that whole process, you had personal calls with Bernie Eccleston too, mate, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I lived... Uh, uh, I lived in a, a little house in Ermington, in uh, not too far from where you grew up as a kid. And, um, you know, again, I just, again, it could have been naivety. It could have been over-enthusiasm or, uh, you know, um, I don't know what. But I just thought, stuff it, let's cut, cut, through, cut through all the crap and just ring the big guy. And so I rang, I rang uh, 
you know, uh, Formula One management and uh, I asked to speak with Bernie Eccleston and uh, the lady said, uh, yes, who are you and, and uh, what's it about? And I said, I'm from Network 10 Australia and it's about Formula One. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't say, you know, I want to be a commentator. And she's like, yes, okay. And I, so I'd go to sleep and uh, in the middle of the night, Sydney time, my phone rang and this happened not once but twice and I answered it and the lady said, yes, uh, Mr. Diffie, Mr. Eccleston's ready to speak with you now. And, um, you know, say, say, what, say what you like about Bernie. He rang me twice. Mm. You know, he, he returned mm. my call, I should say. He returned my call twice and was very polite, very nice with me. He said, Yes, well, I don't make those calls, but these the, these are the gentlemen you need to call who look after our television, and uh, you tell them that I told them to call, you, told you to call them. Amazing. And uh, you know nothing nothing materialised by that about that, but at least I got to talk with Bernie. Obviously, I'd meet him many times years later, but um, but yeah, it was. I thought I'd have a crack. <laughs> good on, good on you, mate. The you're a proud Aussie. We know that, but America is very much now home. Um, in that, hang on, hang oh, on, oh. hold on. Oh, here hold we go. On. Stand, stand by. Here hold we go. On. He's about to hold something up here. What, what have we got here? Ho- just one? What are you talking about? Just one. I've got my Brisbane Lions scarf. <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got my Brisbane Lions stuff. I've got my uh, scarf, I should say. I've got my Mighty Maroons. Jersey. Jersey. Yeah. State of origin champions, just in case you yes, needed reminding, you, Lee. Greg. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't go swimming with anything else other than my billabongs. Love it, love it. Still got, still wear my billabongs, and then as you know, my beloved Brisbane Broncos. Fantastic, fantastic. No, I, and I use this podcast as a platform to say no more wooden spoon Broncos. Yeah, you don't belong in last place. We we uh, we do enjoy. Let's fix we, it. We do enjoy the odd text exchange around the time of Origin, particularly if. Um, the Blues, New South Wales are up in my case, or or the Maroons, Queensland are up in your case, and it's been far too much one way on on your side um, over the years. You clearly fell in love with the US very quickly, mate, and a few things a few things happen. You would, um, you know, through your time at, at Le Mans and sports cars and things like that, you would get to know the great Don Panos and and you know the the, the sports car chapter from Daytona Twenty Four Hour and more. And, and getting to work at, at Speed Channel, that played a, a, a very important part in that, that US league, didn't it? Yeah. Um, this, the, I, you know, but bookend, yep. like top and tail in total, I spent 10 years at, at, at Speed and um, it, was, it was wonderful. You know, I have friends, that, uh, made friends and colleagues that will be friends and colleagues for life. Um, and, you know, for us, you know, even though both you and I have, have worked on uh, a multitude of different sports. Motorsport is the main thread through our lives and our careers. For us, working at a working at the world's first twenty four seven motorsports channel network mm. uh, was was awesome. You know, we had everything. Uh, you know, I shouldn't say everything, almost everything. And and you know, the pe- people who worked for Speed at the time, whether on the NASCAR front or the Formula One front, or uh, champ car cart um, through through world rally you know world rally was huge then we had wrc the sports car stuff i mean everything it was just dream and then the studio shows which i got to be a part of speed news and if you watch if you watch talladega nights you see you see them on the set of speed news you know i, I used to that was that was almost a weekly occurrence for me which was a lot of fun yeah mm. I, you i holidayed there at one stage you were based in in charlotte at this point of your, your time in the u.s and you took me around to all sorts of nascar workshops race workshops i mean it's just such a beautiful countryside and such an amazing racing hub there and when we went into speed i was blown away mate because i i had in my head typical america that it would be a smaller scale version of a, of a television station but in many ways it was like walking into a network 10 but just dedicated to motorsport wasn't motorsport. it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, it certainly was. And um, the one that you came to was the new building and, you know, like like anything, you know, there's humble beginnings for everything. Like I told the story before when, we, you know, Network 10 at the studios in Ultimo, which were like, you know, little shoebox, mm. you know, offices and studios and what have you. And then we moved to that massive that massive um, facility in Piermont, which mm. is a beautiful purpose-built uh, building. And speed was the same. Speed was... Uh, uh, towards South Charlotte in in North Carolina, and it was on two sides of a road. There was the 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 executive offices, and then the studios um, were were on the other side. And uh, 
we shared those premises with, with a, uh, a, um, a, an evangelical uh, network, <laughs> which at times was, which at times was pretty interesting, especially when they had some, some, some big performers come in. You know, it was like the president was coming in, you know, areas of the hallway would be blacked out. There were guys in suits and sunglasses and security and you couldn't walk in certain areas oh, of the wow. building. So that was an experience. That was an experience in itself. Um, and then, and then, you know, we moved up the road to the building that you came to, which, yeah, which is, it's full on. There was a little window back in Oz for, for different reasons. And you, you partnered again with, Supercars for me, mate. It it was just a beautiful chapter with with great friends. Sadly, Baz was was gone at this stage, but the sport was more or less at its zenith, if we, if we can say that. You know, it was a, a real a real great time. And you got to call the last Bathurst that you called in in two thousand and six was a very memorable one because Peter Brock had passed away. Craig Lowndes would would win it that day with with Jamie Wincup, and you use words like you know on the day that he farewelled his friend. Did you have a, a lump in your throat that day? I mean, it was hard not to, wasn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah, yeah yeah yeah. And I was just discussing this with somebody else uh, just recently. Um, actually, it was with Matthew White on his radio show on his morning radio show, and he asked me about that day, and and um, we uh, obviously. Uh, it was a combination of uh, typically Billy Woods would host the broadcast, right? And then we would call, but then I, I can't remember why, but for, f- maybe because it was for the special significance, we weren't in the commentary box pre-race. Uh, Crompo and I, I think, and yourself, we were all down in the pit lane doing different interviews because, you know, Billy was, Billy was the, you know, captain of the ship. He had it under control and we were, we were gathering interviews. And, and I remember I went down, you remember, they did that special parade Cars, in, yes. in all nine mm-hmm. of Peter, Peter's cars. And so, you know, Greg Murphy got to drive one, Craig Lowndes got to drive one, I think Scafey drove one, everybody else, whoever else got to drive. And I happened to be standing kind of, whether it's the right or wrong place at the wrong or right time, when Craig finished that lap and got out of the car and then I think the national anthem was performed and I had just done an interview with David Brabham and we were looking right at Craig and he was crying. He was just, he was sobbing. And and I'm so pleased to be proved wrong because I, the first thing I said to Brabs is, you know, Lounsey shot and he's not going to win mm. today. Yeah. Look at and what look happened. At what happened. Yeah. You know, you turn that, you turn that emotion around and you use it as a positive, you use it as a positive tool and Craig and Jamie did an amazing day, that, the job that day. But for Craig, yeah, that's, that's for all of the, I don't know. I don't know if I've called thousands of races. I guess I have. I guess for 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 the thousands of races I've called, that certainly um, is a very memorable Great stuff, one. mate. You would move back to the states and some. Can I can Please. I say something? Can I yeah. say something before? And and you you respectfully um, respectfully jumped over it, uh, which which I am grateful for you doing that. But I don't mind talking about it. You said I came back to Australia for for one or mm. a variety of reasons. I came back to Australia because I got mm. divorced. And, you know, people talk about my career um, very lovingly and, and in glowing terms and, and, and makes me, you know, uh, proud of my accomplishments. But, you know, there's a toll. There's always a toll to pay for everything. And, and uh, my first marriage w- was part of that. You know, um, I was very uh, hell-bent and driven on, on succeeding and making the, the overseas uh, a gamble work that I was probably blind you know, blind to uh, a part of my life, which was my marriage, my first marriage. And, um, you know, you know, unfortunately, my first wife was a casualty of that. And my marriage was a casualty of that. And so I was very grateful to, uh, you know, we came, we came back to Australia to try and make it work and it didn't work. And I was very grateful to David White, who, who uh, gave me a two-year contract to be with you and be with Billy and, 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 and Daz and Crompo and everybody. And those two years... Uh, turned the ship around for me, you know, got me uh, loving life again, feeling positive, doing good work. And it was in those two years that I met my, my, my now wife and my, you know, the love of my life, who I have two kids with, uh, Michaela. And um, so something good came out of something bad. But, you know, there's a, there's a casualty and there's a price to pay for everything, you know, and that unfortunately that was mine. Here's some history. Across 63 days in 1909, 3.2 million paving bricks were laid on top of the original surface to upgrade the Indianapolis Speedway. 
Then in 1938, the entire track was paved with asphalt except for the middle portion of the front straightaway. This became known as the famous Yard of Bricks. In Australia the Spectator Hill at Bathurst is known as the Yard of Bricks. Formula One. Going to Monaco, working for uh, a great American network, getting to be beside David Hobbs and Steve Matchett and the, and the trio formed a very special bond. You would do things like um, e- even do uh, stage shows, if you will, or, or, or gatherings of theatres for fans to come and, and learn more about Formula One away from television. It was a great, you know, that in itself, the, the bond between you guys was pretty special and it came through on air, didn't it? Yeah, it was it was terrific, and and you know that was a tough situation as well because I I that was the end of my period at at, uh, at Speed Channel, but I h- had always you know I, the opportunity to go to NBC was there because NBC was getting IndyCar and Formula One at the same time, so it was a huge jump. And the the Speed Channel Formula One team of Bob Varsha, who was the play by play commentator and host for so long in America is a really good friend of mine. We both lived in Atlanta and uh, together not too far from each other. I work with Bob a lot. And so NBC said, we're going to take the whole team over from Speed Channel, except Bob, that's going to be your job, Lee. And so that was a little bit difficult. That was a bit tricky for me because you never want to, you never want to, you know, you don't want to be put in that situation, but at the same time, you're grateful for the opportunity. So we had five years on NBC, Formula One on NBC, myself and Hobbo and Steve and Will Buxton, it was really good times. Um, we feel as though we grew the sport in the United States. The ratings certainly reflected that. Uh, it was a shame when it all came to an end, but it was it was very cool to go to Monaco and Barcelona for testing, and and of course then the, in the early days of the U.S. Grand Prix at Circuit of the Americas, um, which is coming up now close to you know it's getting close to its ten year um, anniversary. Um, so yeah, we were we were we were part of some some really great times. Um, obviously, Monaco was 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 the the top of the hill. We would host the show over near the ocean on the Prince Rainier Quay, and then uh, Steve and David would leave. And but before they left, um, we would pre-record the final segment of the of the pre-race show. The rest of it was live, 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 live. But the commentary booth was over near Raskas and uh, across the other side of the harbour. And so Steve and David would go. We had a tender. The NBC would arrange a tender, pay for a tender <laughs> with, with the harbour master. And Steve and David would leave and they'd scurry down the stairs. And I, I'd still have to, had to do another segment myself before we got to the, the tape segment. And so Steve and David would go. They'd get on the tender. The tender would take them across the harbour and then they'd go up to the commentary booth. The tender would come back to get me. And so we, we, I would go from the hosting set across the harbour up to the booth in the space of a very short segment and a commercial break. And it worked great for years, except this one time the tender kind of forgot and went and picked somebody else up instead. So I'm standing there and the cars are coming round to the grid. And I'm like, holy hell, I'm going to miss the start of the, the Monaco Grand Prix. And I, I got there with about, I don't know, 30 seconds to spare or something, you know, out of breath after running up two, two flights and two stories, I should say. And, uh, yeah, they were, there are lots of happy times. They, they were really good times. People don't realise sometimes it's a military operation behind the scenes, mate, to get to get stuff to happen, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. And you, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of wriggle room for things to go wrong. Um, but the whole the whole uh, the whole time at NBC has been quite the ride. It's been awesome. You know, it's um, eight years has flown by. I've just finished my eighth year with with the Peacock, so um, and done lots of lots of really cool things. So I'm enjoying the ride. Mate, and and just on that subject, Olympic Games. I mean, to think you were talking earlier in the podcast about rocking up to sports tonight, working in a newsroom for the first time. You and I are a little bit last bastion in that we're not traditionally university qualified or, or trained, and we'd probably never recommend to an aspiring, you know, broadcaster or journalist not to do that now. But to think you got to go to the Olympic Games and and call some great stuff, and and let's hope that. Japan happens, mate. If it does, what what's your role there? What are you going to do? Uh, so Tokyo. So let's knock on wood. Let's uh, you know every everything going right at, in Tokyo. I'll call track and field. Fantastic. Which I'm really, 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 really excited about. Yeah. So it'll be my fourth games. Yep. Um, my fir- my first games were in Sochi in Russia, uh, the Winter Games, of course, and I did uh, bobsled, skeleton, and luge. So again, a form of racing, uh, super exciting. And I got to do that a couple of years ago in Pyeongchang. And then at my first summer games in Rio, I did rowing and uh, canoe 
kayak or the, the flat water sports. So um, yeah, certainly a long, uh, you know, very different from from motor racing. But again, it's racing, mm. right? So a, a race, a race is a race is a race. Just the parts and the characteristics of the race change, and 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 the the duration changes. You know, from going to, you know. Um, say calling the Rolex 24 at Daytona or a 24-hour sports car race mm. to calling a bobsled or a luge race, which lasts about 38 seconds. You have to set it up, you have to call the race, you have to story tell, and you have to share it with your commentary partner as well, yeah. with it, all within 38 seconds. You know, it's so um, you, have to, you have to balance it out. And again, it's getting outside your comfort zone and learning a new discipline and, and a new sport and... and um, yeah, relying on what you've learned over all the years and trying to blend it all into one. Have you stopped and soaked that in for a second? An Aussie for the biggest network that covers the Olympics, calling track and field, that is mighty. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited and nervous because um, it, cause it's, you know, it's a... It's a it's a pretty hefty responsibility and uh, but the one thing the one thing that NBC does incredibly well is uh, they... It's almost like to use the Penske, uh, Team Penske analogy. Roger Penske gives all of his teams, whether it be, you know, they've just finished their, their sport, their IMSA sports car program, that's, that's no longer for them, but whether it be supercars in Australia, whether it be IndyCar, whether it be NASCAR, whatever, whatever Team Penske's involved in, Roger's mantra is, I will give you everything you need, therefore you kind of don't have any excuses. You know, perform. We've hired you to perform, so perform. I'll give you all the resources you need. And NBC are very much like that, where you know the the, the Olympic research department is incredible. You never you're never going to fall through the cracks um, unsupported. You know, you you are you are encouraged. You are treated well. You are supported well with information and resources and personnel. So therefore, what's left Deliver. is do your job. Yeah. Do, yeah, mm. deliver, do your job. Mm. And um, so to me, uh, I, I don't find that daunting. I find that exciting. Uh, I think okay. that's a, a really good way to operate because, you know, you, there are no excuses. No, well, no, mm. sorry, why did you get that wrong? Why did you forget that? We gave you that. Research supplied you that. You read that. You should, you know, so it, it's good. There's, there's big expectations, but the rewards are, are certainly worth it. And the motorsport continues um, as, uh, you know, the, the mainstay, if you will. 2019 first non-American to call the Indy 500. That is huge, my brother. Yeah, that was that was a great day. That was a great day. This year was bizarre with no fans, but 2019 was was really special. Um, made even more, made even more um, just beautiful and memorable uh, because my mum came over from Australia, from Brisbane. Excellent. My wife and my wife and two sons were there. I had some really good friends from Connecticut. Phil Christensen to go all the way back to near the beginning of this podcast. Uh, Christo came over uh, with some some uh, some friends. So yeah, that was I had some really key people in in the timeline of my life um, there there to share that that with me. So am I right in saying you really soak it up to mate? You get there before dawn and you you do all sorts of things to really get in the in the zone for it, don't you? Well, you got to get there before dawn because the bloody traffic jam. <laughs> <laughs> Forget soaking it up. No, no, no. It's uh, yeah, to 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 um, to get there in those you know when it when it's dark and you see sunrise and 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 uh, yeah, the build up is crazy. That's why this year was so bizarre. You know, there's mm. in excess of three hundred thousand people there uh, year in year out, and this year because of COVID, have nobody was such such an extreme and such such a shock and where we are we're on the ninth we commentate from the ninth floor of the pagoda so we have an unbelievable view we can see as they come out of turn three along mm-hmm. the short shoot through turn four we're directly like where i sit i'm directly above the yard of bricks mm-hmm. and they come past us and you can see them go into one so not that we commentate by looking out the window but if you need to you can and mm-hmm. and uh, so we have an amazing view so you can see in in that span from turn three Around here, you can see, you know, I don't know, 150,000 people. Just awesome. Because you, you can see the infield as well. Mm. There, there's so many things going on at Indy mm. for people to be wherever you want to be, whether whether it's the snake pit where the live concerts are going on. And I think probably most of the people in there don't know that there's a race going on. <laughs> <laughs> they part, they're, they're partying and having a great time. But, yeah, you can see so many people. So this year to look out, the same 
um, the same vista and see nobody was quite eerie. Wild. Yeah, very much so. It was very, uh, it, was, it was really, uh, I was a very proud Australian that day. I'm a proud uh, naturalised American citizen, but of course, you know, I carry my, my, my Aussie heritage with me very, very, very close to my heart. And so, you know, Australians have a, 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 an interesting history at Indianapolis. And so to be the first Aussie and, and non-American to be the play-by-play was, was a huge honour. Yeah, mate, you to be congratulated. It's just uh, I, super cool. You're great with people. You always have been from, um, you know, taking calls from Roger Penske. You talked about Bernie Eccleston before. Mario Andretti is, is another one. But on the side of that, you're great at building um, relationships that are important to you. You and I must speak, you know, every week or two at least. You've forged a great friendship with Calvin Fish in the United States, haven't you? Mm-hmm. And and he, his story and his his time in racing himself, he's a great broadcaster now as well, but his time in racing when he was up against Senna, uh, he's a terrific, terrific steerer, mate, wasn't he? Yeah, he was, yeah. I mean, not, not too many people have Calvin's story of, of, of going wheel to wheel with Ed and Senna when they, when they were young guys in, in uh, Formula Ford and, and, uh, and in F3. Um, you know, though Calvin says, yeah, there, there weren't too many wheel to wheel battles because mm. Senna was always in front. Or if I got close to him, he ran me off the track. <laughs> but, you know, they would hang out, they, they would hang out at the local cafe at lunch, you know, up near Snedderton when they were there doing test days and, and what have you. And, and, um, you know, Calvin's a little bit of a humble hero because he did, he did some terrific things in his racing career, um, uh, you know, winning winning uh, at Daytona at the Rolex 24 and winning the Sebring 12-hour with Robbie Gordon uh, and Linson James for Roush Racing. Uh, and, um, yeah, so I'm pleased that he's been able to have both uh, a really uh, a great career. Uh, he, he wanted it to go further. He would have loved to have gone to F1 or IndyCup. But he made a very pivotal decision at, a, at an important time in his life to go broadcasting and, it, and it's worked couple of ones to lead to the finish here, mate. Firstly, Scott McLaughlin leaves this part of mm-hmm. the world as a triple supercars champion. Um, he's got a big mission in front of him. For people that are listening to the podcast that are supercars fans, give them an insight into how this guy has been received uh, in the United States and his his potential. It's a big move, I know, and, a, and, a, and a, quite a change of discipline. But what do you think about Scott McLaughlin? Oh, I think he's, I think, I think he's, a, he's, a, he's going to be a champion wow i think there's no reason i think there's no reason why you know he and uh he will he will he will surprise people Mm. this year there's going to be some there will be some tough uh learning moments Mm. but he will surprise people this year uh you i don't think what happened at saint petersburg uh at his first indycar race was any a true indicate in the race a true indication of how well that he will do next year and in the future um what was incredible was the fact that he did the Bathurst 1000 on a Sunday, jumped on a plane, flew not only to, to LA, then all the way across the United States to Charlotte, North Carolina, did not go to bed, went straight on the simulator to get ready, then slept. So then he's dealing with getting physically and mentally getting over Bathurst. Physically and mentally, he knew that he wasn't going back to Australia at that point in time. That hadn't become public yet, but he knew. Uh, and confided in a few of us that that was the case. So he and Carly, his wife, they leave. So you're dealing with the goodbye factor. You're dealing with the physical factor and the mental factor. And then you're going to be racing an IndyCar for the first time at a track that you've never raced at before, all within a week of doing Australia's biggest motor race. And it totally, you know, it's like, you know, it, it couldn't couldn't have been a greater extreme and a greater test and examination. And in and in the practice sessions, and he was disappointed with himself in qualifying but in the practice sessions he was so methodical he didn't do anything crazy he got faster and faster and faster and better and better and better and i mean you're talking you know pretty close in times uh, the difference between maybe being fifth or 15th and he slotted right in there and at times he was level right on level with joseph newgarden who was vying for his third championship he with will power with simon pagina you know pretty lofty Pretty, pretty lofty company and pretty lofty teammates, right? And um, he didn't, he wasn't overawed. Uh, and in fact, he, you know, he expects so much of himself that he was pretty, he was pissed at himself for qualifying and, and then got tangled up in the race and, and ended up not finishing. But that is not representative of how well he will go. And you don't have to, you don't have to convince any of his now peers in the, in the IndyCar paddock. They know how naturally gifted and how talented and how fast he is. 
Scott Dixon. I mean, just a super talent, mate, in and out of the car. He might be 40 now, but he'll he'll definitely be a factor in 2021, won't he? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Scott, Scott is so... So, um, so young as far as his, you know, age is, you know, what's the old adage? Age is just a number. And then Scott, Scott personifies that, you know, um, to, to, to have, you know, won his sixth IndyCar championship, you know, be, be one off AJ Foyt. Um, you know, I, I, I run out of uh, superlatives for Scott because he conducts himself so well. He's so, he's so meticulously prepared. He's so, you know, he will admit that this year he made a few uncharacteristic, un Scott Dixon like errors. He felt the pressure, you know, he kind of felt the walls closing in a little bit. Um, you know, to lead the championship every step of the way, you don't want to, you know, throw it away or give it away at the last or second last race. Um, so the pressure was mounting there on him. Um, but yeah. For a, for a kid who grew up in New Zealand to, to, to make the step and then do what he's done over the past 20 years in open wheel racing over here is remarkable. And you won't, you know how some drivers, you know how some drivers won't, won't concede or won't, won't compliment or won't give anything to certain other drivers? You won't meet, you won't meet one person in the IndyCar paddock, one driver in the IndyCar paddock who doesn't speak uh, with 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 enormous reverence when it comes to Scott Dixon, and why wouldn't you? He's the he's the class of the field. Most definitely. Could Will Power give an Australian another Indy Five Hundred win? I, lo- I love the fact that gradually on social media we're seeing more and more of his personality. Is I've worked with his comedian brother, who's crazy, <laughs> um, but you know he's still a um, a mighty force too, isn't he? Oh yeah, absolutely. Will Will is um, Will is spectacularly fast. Um, and yeah, there's no there, there's no reason why why he, he he couldn't get another one. But that's the great thing about about um, the NTT IndyCar series. Somebody uh, before this before this year's race, uh, you know, where we have to do our um, uh, media commitments and you know interviews with with whether it's uh, network affiliates or podcasts or radio interviews or whatever it might be. Somebody said to me. Um, uh, so how many how many drivers in this race could could actually win the race? And I said probably two thirds. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> you know, there's thir- there's thir- there's there's thirty three cars, and I said probably two thirds of the field can legitimately win this race. And that's really that's a lovely thing to to have that many good drivers with the series uh, from a a. Um, a sporting and technical regulation standpoint for the series to be that that stable and that competitive that when we go to the racetrack, you know, and you and I love Formula One as much as anybody else, but it is somewhat predictable, right? You know, that it's going to be Mercedes, it's either going to be either the Mercedes, Verstappen's going to be there. It was terrific to see Checo Perez get his first win, but you, you kind of know where it's going to go. With IndyCar, we go to the track every week and have no idea. I love it. Yeah, I mean, you can go to you can go to certain tracks and you say, well, based on you know history, he's really strong here, but that doesn't mean that that particular driver is going to win. Which is the beautiful thing as a as a live sports broadcaster to have that. Um, that uh, unpredictable nature to it. It's it's in a great space, mate, and you're part of a very good commentary team to to watch and to to listen to the action. Couple to finish. Firstly, uh, supercars going through some potential change from a, a commentary lineup for 2021. There was one story that I read that suggested they may have reached out to you to see if you would be interested. You're clearly focused on America. Did they reach out to see if you would you would come back? No. No. Not at all. No. Yeah. No. Like, no. No, no, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where that came from. But nobody, no, I didn't. Uh, I mean, my, I'm under contract here for several more years at NBC, and my my life and my family are here. So as much as I, you know, the 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 notion of of uh, coming back to some warm Queensland beaches or something <laughs> like that sounds pretty 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 good right now. As we we're gearing up for, uh, I think there's 15 inches of snow predicted here oh. tonight in, in my hometown here in Connecticut. So thinking of Noosa on Queensland Sunshine Coast, while that sounds pretty good, no, that's that's it's not a it's not even an option. Very cool. Okay, the boys have got some Honda dirt bikes. Are you okay mm-hmm. with that? How are they going with that? Yeah, they're going good. We have a um, we have a small property uh up in in New York about an hour and a half from here um some some acreage and the boys ride around there so excellent they they love it they're, they're loving it unfortunately for for um, mum and dad's uh 
wallet and purse, they've already uh, pretty much pretty pretty much outgrown the the, the bikes that they're on. So uh, they're they're already hassling me about the the next the next larger one. So um, we'll we'll see we'll see. As Barry Sheen used to say, answer on a postcard. Yeah. I hope you uh, remember some of the lessons that Pedro told you or taught you as well, mate, about bike bike preparation and things like that. What set of wheels does Lee Diffie drive? And I, I'm told from the time that you kind of returned to the United States to now, you've kept one vehicle that's a bit close to your heart, haven't you? Yeah, and I, I drive it almost every day. Uh, this, this is a this is a um, a great dis- was a great point point of disappointment to uh, to the F one viewers when they would, would see uh, David Hobbs and myself and Steve Matchett or Will or whatever. Um, at, at a hotel or at a restaurant or at a bar or something, they'd be like, hey, hey, what, 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 what do you drive on the road? And David Hobbs would say, well, I'm a Honda dealer, so I just take one from the, the Honda dealership, so I drive a Honda Accord. And they'd be like, oh. <laughs> yeah, they, they wanted David. They, want, they wanted David to say something, you know, a, a Porsche or a, a, a Bentley or an Aston Martin or something like that. And they say, well, what about you, Lee? I say, I drive a 2008 Dodge Ram 1500. <laughs> they'd be like, oh. <laughs> She's a great reader. They say, oh, yeah, so it's still going strong. So I make sure my wife has a nice car and I, I, uh, I uh, go all over the place in the, in the trusty old truck. Good stuff. You get a chance in your role as a broadcaster at times to go for rides or drives. Uh, is there one that sticks in, in your mind that you, you, know, you were blown away by to, to sample it, to be passenger for, for a moment? Oh, that's a good one, Rusty. Um, bloody hell. Uh, oh yes, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That's easy. That's an easy one. That's not a hard one. That's an easy one. It was last year at the Indy 500. Prior, prior to the Indy 500, I got to do two laps around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in the Honda two seater with with Mario Andretti. Oh, how was that? That was awesome. It was awesome. And uh, Mario has been so good to me over the years. Uh, I'm I'm proud to be able to call him a friend. Mm. He, when we would go around and do our, our F1 theatre shows, we would do one about half an hour down the road from Mario's place in Pennsylvania and Mario would come for free and, and just to hang it, just to hang out on stage and talk Formula One. I mean, it's so generous, so generous with his time. Um, uh, and so um, when they said, do you want to you go for a ride with Mari? I was like, yeah, I don't, don't need to think about that. So it was amazing. And he, he gets in full race mode. He's serious. Like he's, it's not just tinkering around. He, as soon as you get belted in, they fire the car up. He's, he's into it. So that was awesome. That was a, that was a, a life-changing moment. I'll bet. The, the sensations must have been, like, you know, could you feel it on your neck? Could you sense that? What was it like? Yeah. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. And, you know, we were probably doing 190 miles an hour, 185, 190 miles an hour in the two seater. And so, you know, the other, the, the, the real guys, uh, in the race, are approaching turn one at 240 miles an hour. And, uh, it's just insane. But even in with Mario in the two seater, cranking that two seater as hard as he could and going out to the walls and, and then and then coming off turn four and diving down towards pit wall and then coming back up for turn one and yeah it was a it helped me call a better race I think mm. just just that one just those two laps you know obviously I, I sit beside uh, Paul Tracy and Townsend Bell Townsend did 10 Paul you know got very close to winning it uh, and he, he will still argue to this day that he won it in 2002 but um, you know, to sit beside those guys and the, the wealth of knowledge they have um, around that place is is awesome. So, but just just those two laps, it was like I said, it was a game changer for me. Final one, probably very hard to do because you've ticked some incredible boxes: Le Mans twenty four hour, Daytona twenty four hour, Monaco Grand Prix, Indianapolis five hundred, Bathurst one thousand. Is there one in the thousands that you described before? that kind of stands out for a special reason. Was it 2019 Indy 500? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think it was. Mm. I think it was because because um, because I was the first foreign voice uh, to be play-by-play. David Hobbs and mm. Sir Jackie Stewart, they called they called Indy, but they were analysts. You know, there hasn't been a foreign mm. play-by-play call it for American television. So I'm very proud of that um, and got to do that in NASCAR as well when I, when I uh, did that in, in um, uh, Watkins Glen in Michigan several years ago. Um, so yeah, I, I would say Indy and, and people say not the Olympics or anything like that. And I say, well, in, in, 
in all due respect to everything else I've done, lots of people have broadcast the Olympics and lots of people have, have, have broadcast Bathurst and, and, and other events and Le Mans, et cetera. But, but not, not many have been the play by play for the Indianapolis 500 over the, over the course of, of time. So yeah, I'm really, I'm very, very fond of that, uh, accomplishment and, and really proud of it for my family name. Mate, you should be. Congratulations on everything you've done. It's a remarkable 20-year story, and I hope there's even more great chapters to come, my brother. And let's finish with a little bit of fun. You took, when you left Australia, to go to America, Mm -hmm. a posty bike. Yeah, I want the new one. Have you seen the no, new go. one? No, you know what? I... The new oh, there's there's a new one. You look look yeah. it up. I mean, uh, it's I think it's called the 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 CT Trail yeah. or the the CT one two five Trail or something like that. It's a really cool looking bike. But I had <clears throat> my cousin in Shepparton, and she used to work for Australia Post. And um, I said, "Do you ever go to those auctions?" And she said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can get you a bike." So I got it for seven hundred and fifty bucks. And I had it, she bought it for me years ago and it stayed on her farm in Shepparton for, I don't know, probably five years. And, um, I would come back to Australia with you and Daz and everybody else and, and we'd do the MotoGP at Phillip Island or we'd do whatever and, uh, do the odd job here or there for Honda Australia. And, um, yeah, they were friends and I didn't send them an invoice and they were like, Lee, we've got to give you something. What can we do for you? And I said, I tell you what you can do for me. Can you send a truck? up from Melbourne to my cousin's farm in Shepparton, pick up my postie, take it back to Honda MPE headquarters uh, in um, Campbell, Campbell? Yeah, Campbellfield there in, in uh, near, 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 Campbell the airport, near, Campbellfield. near the airport. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And I said, give it some love, pull it apart, give it the big ones over and make sure it's all good to go and then send it over to my house. I was living in Charlotte, North Carolina then. And uh, I was away working and my wife called and said, babe, there's a big truck and it's got a big crate on the back of it and this guy's unloading it. And I said, oh, that's the postie. They sent it over with this big steel frame fully assembled and it just arrived like that. And anyway... um, the guys at Honda were, you know, at the front end of the story, they were like, come on, you need to, we need to do something for you. We need to do something for you. So what started out as like a small favor when they sent it over. And then when they finally rang to say, Hey, we see that it's been delivered. And I said, yeah, thanks so much for that. And they said, yeah, no problem. We think it's the world's most bloody expensive posty bike. <laughs> <laughs> awesome stuff. We've had some great adventures uh, along the way. I, I can fondly recall going dirt bike riding with the likes of Daryl and Jeff Leesk and, and Murph and, and others um, in WA after the, the rounds at Wanneroo and stuff like that. Mate, that's awesome that you've kept that machine. As I said before, well done on uh, on everything that you've achieved and um, we hope that 2021 is an even more successful year for you. Thank you, mate. Yeah, it's been quite the ride. Let's hope it keeps going. And I, I'm just, I'm shocked and I'm disappointed that you haven't mentioned about when you put my life and Daryl Beatty's life in grave danger when you crashed, <laughs> when you crashed that, that at Tarago on the way down to Phillip Island that year, and you went in, you went in down a big ditch, and Daryl and I could Daryl and I could have been killed. Stop it! The car that we need to set the record straight here. The car got a little bit loose in damp conditions. Tell tell the audience what I said while I'm desperately trying to catch it. Well, I think it got loose because Daryl pulled on the handbrake, didn't he? <laughs> yes, he did too. <laughs> oh brother! Oh brother! 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 Oh brother! Brother! I've got this. And it, end, it ends up sideways and the, it was like a scene out of a movie because the next thing I saw was a busload of tourists that were clearly going to the Penguin Parade at Phillip Island and they're all looking out the window of the car at us. <laughs> Thank you, you like, Lee. Thank you, you for were telling like, you. you. You were like a crab running along the beach. You are like this, you had all hands everywhere. You're all going, you're trying, to, <laughs> trying to catch it. <laughs> Uh, It's been wonderful to catch up, brother. Love you. And thank you so much for the walk down memory lane. Super cool. Thank you, mate. And I saw on a a, a poll recently that your podcast is uh, the most listened to motorsport podcast in Australia. So well done. Well done to you and the the whole podcast one gang. Nice work. Cheers. Chuff, mate. Thank you. Rusty's Garage is written and presented by me, Greg Rust. Series producer and editor is Alex Mitchell. Audio production by Darcy Thompson. I'm Greg Rust. Enjoy the drive, but drive safely. Listener.